very happy to hear him give this talk um, with some of his collaborators from um, also Microsoft and from ETH Zurich, where he used to be a professor um, and still has some affiliations. Um, so very excited to kick off this uh, keynote session for Thursday with Matthias's talk on achieving practical quantum advantage in quantum chemistry simulations. Matthias? Okay, thank you, James, and thanks to the NIGA, uh, to all the NIGA organizers for the NIGA, the NIGA t t t t t invitation. I want to motivate first kind of why chemistry really is is in, 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 in my mind the applications for quantum computing thing, and then I left. I will let my collaborators show some 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 details of work work we did recently and talk about what this did to really make 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 quantum computing useful for chemistry. So what we want to do with quantum hardware is you want to achieve what we call a practical quantum advantage. That means we want to solve an interesting problem, something uh, that's not just a, a random problem, but something useful, either better or faster on the quantum hardware than we could do on the best classical algorithm with the best classical computer. So really use it to solve a problem that I could not solve classically or to solve it better than I can. And when you read the news articles, then you hear about the big maze of the applications from drug design to fighting hunger, solving big data, stock market things, the weather predictions. There are loads of problems that are claimed to be really useful for quantum the, 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 the computing. And that is based on the fact that for all these problems, asymptotically, there is a quantum speed up based on one of the many well-known quantum algorithms. But I want to argue that quantum speed up is not all. You need more than quantum speed up. Because when we talk about quantum speed up, then we talk about the asymptotic scaling. That means as the problem size goes to infinity and the random goes to infinity, ultimately the quantum computer will, uh, will negate scale better. But what we need for a practical quantum advantage, we need the crossover time, the time where the quantum, so the time to solve a problem where quantum is better than classical, you need that to be the, the short enough. It should be of the order of days or weeks and not years or centuries. And so we need to look for problems where the crossover size is so small that the crossover time is so short that it becomes practical. And for that, not only the asymptotic scaling matters, but also constants. And so I want to now look at, look at an, uh, the, 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 the comparison of some future quantum computer with today's classical computer to see kind of where the crossover could be. And I want to find a lower bound by being super optimistic for the, 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 the quantum computer. And I want to be super pessimistic for the classical one. So that when we find that something, the classical computer is better, that then it will for sure be better in 10 years, in 20 years. And when we find that, that there's something where quantum could help, then classical could still catch up. And so the way I want to compare it is on the classical side, I want to take a single of today's existing classical chips, a single chip like the, the latest year and the video GPU. And that I want to compare to a future fault 
tolla rente, rente, uh, rente ja, quantum computer with 10,000 logical qubits, a logical cycle time of a few microseconds, and all to all the connectivity. So I want to, to ignore all problems problems, problems with the, 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 the layout and the, the, the data movement. So I want to compare those two devices and see when will that future quantum computer be the single of today's classical chips. And when one listens to people talking about quantum, one of the first claims that one hears is quantum computers will solve the big data problems because they can work on exponentially amounts of data. But when we look, you look a bit closer at those two devices, then the classical chip can read 10,000 gigabit a second. That's the, the, the IO bandwidth to a single GPU. But when you look at tomorrow's quantum computer uh, that I mentioned with 10,000 logical qubits with a cycle time of you know, 10 microseconds, then you can load at most one gigabit a second into that. So the nigga IO bandwidth in the, the nigga quantum computer is 10,000 times smaller than into the classical one. And so big data will be an even bigger problem for quantum computers than for classical one. And so that's why we say that quantum computers will excel for big compute problems on small data and not on the big data problems. Now, some people then counter that QRAM will solve this. And yes, I would love to have a QRAM, but as we all know, QRAM is not fault tolerant. QRAM is analog. And so the way I tend to extremely present QRAM is you take a hard disk and now you want to put the read head into a quantum superposition of all possible locations on that hard drive. And we all know that will not work because of your the, 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 the coherence. So anything analog like the read head here or something analog optical or anything that's an optical version of QRAM or, or something analog will not scale ultimately because of the coherence, because it's analog. To make it fault tolerant, one has to go to digital. And once we go to digital, then we run into the same bandwidth uh, with the gear limitation that I mentioned before. So quantum computers are good for problems that I can describe with small data, but that are a big compute problem. And then one also often hears that quantum computers are fast since, since they can explore exponentially many options at the same time. And that is not quite true because while the nigger while the nigger the, the quantum year superposition can work on exponentially many configurations at once when i read it out i have a challenge naively i get to get something random quite often i just get a near grover speed up and so I'd like to now look into how much could I get with a Grover speed up with something quadratic. And when I again look at today's classical chip versus tomorrow's optimistic quantum computer, then the current classical chips, if I take the, ch the GPU, can do about one third of a petaflop per second on a single chip. If I build, build it as a, and the ASIC you can do a bit more. And when I don't do a like, floating point operation, but something illogical, then I can do negative tens of your petter ops a second. While the quantum computer, if I build an adder or a, 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 like, a multiplier unit, then I can do maybe about seven then get kilo ops a second. So the, the, the classical computer is about a factor 10 to the 11 faster in the constants than that quantum computer I've envisioned. And first, 
the speed that we have has to overcome the 10 to 11 orders of magnitude of constant slowdown of the quantum computer versus the classical chip. And we have to see kind of what quantum speed up do you need for that? And I can turn that around. I can say, let's have an Oracle. And in that Oracle, I want to do operations. And the question is, how many operations can I afford in the Oracle so that the quantum computer will have a crossover time where it shows the quantum advantage in about two weeks? And when you then calculate it through, then you realize you cannot even do 0 0.01 floating point operations. So you can't even do one floating point operations. If there's a single floating point operation in the Oracle, the cost of time is already years. With logical operations, you can do a bit more. You can do about 70 logical operations. Again, super optimistically on the quantum side. So based on that, we're saying that while Grover speedups, quadratic speedups are asymptotically there, to realize them practically, we don't see a way there. The cost of the times will be too long. So we'll need more than quadratic speed up. With the cubic speed up, I can do a bit. With with neo quadratic speed up more. And even better, I think the real application will be the ones with exponential speed up. And so those are the ones we want to focus on. So if now I want to look again at the maze of applications. Then things like weather predictions and stock market predictions drop out because of the big data problem. Others drop out because of, of the, 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 the quadratic speed up challenge. And what really remains are problems in factoring numbers or simulating the quantum systems. And that's really why we have the 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 like a big interest in chemistry applications because that's where we can get the next exponential speed up and have have like a, uh, like a really interesting applications and so i want to move now to super quad quadratic speed up in the, 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 the chemistry applications where we recently worked through details of what is needed to really solve a problem. And the reaction we looked at that is one for the carbon dioxide gear fixation using a ruthenium catalyst. And for the, the details on the chemistry, I want to pass on to, to my collaborator, the Vera von Burg. Are you here, Vera? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. So, hi, everybody. Oh, hi, everybody. Um, um, Vera von Burg. Vera von Burg. Um, um, uh, sorry, do you yeah, also sorry, hear me? Oh, okay, good. So I'm a PhD student in the group of Marcus Ryer, and I will be filling in for him in this part of the talk. So we came together here to understand whether and how quantum computers will be a transformative power for... Oh, sorry, can you come back? Uh, can you, yeah, whether there will be a transformative power for quantum chemistry. But to really understand the global impact of quantum computing, we of course have to ask ourselves, where does quantum chemistry itself have the biggest impact? And where we see this is definitely in the realm of reaction mechanism elucidation. And you see here on the top of the slide, uh, a sample reaction of, con of a conversion of CO2 to methanol. And any chemist knows that this way of writing the reaction is merely a conceptual crutch because it's a stark oversimplification of the whole process. So first of all, typically you will require a catalyst to speed up the reaction. An example is shown here in the middle. And this adds a lot of complexity, not just due to its size, but also because they often contain transition metals, which have usually a complicated electronic structure. 
But even if you do not have a catalyst, you we still know that the reaction will not proceed in this simple one-step fashion that is shown, but instead it will, it will involve multiple individual reactions um, and also possibly competing side reactions leading to side products. So this is why it's really important to get a good understanding of the underlying reaction mechanism. And in this talk, I would like to give you a bit of a perspective on how we model these processes and how the quantum computer comes in. So next slide, please. Okay, so um, the problem of reaction mechanism elucidation is important from a theoretical point of view or interesting because we face the same challenges that we also do in usual traditional quantum chemistry methods, such as the strong correlation problem, the dynamic correlation problem, and so on. But it's also really relevant for industry because almost the entirety of chemical industry is in fact concerned with using reactions to obtain a certain target product. And so as, as we heard in the discussion part about open problems in quantum in chemistry by de Jong, what we are usually interested in is to have a control over these reactions. And we can only have a control over these reactions if we can truly understand it. So what we want to find out is how can, like the, the requirements that such a reaction mechanism elucidation puts on um, quantum computing for it to be useful. And next slide. So the way we envisage a quantum computer to be used in this process is shown here, and we've also outlined it in the two papers you see at the bottom. And in a process we term the quantum computing enhanced computation and catalysis. So it's separated into two parts, the left one and the right one, where the left part is done on a classical computer with classical algorithms, and the right part is performed by a quantum computer. Now, First, what you first need to do is you need to know all the steps that are participating in your, rea in your reaction. So that means that you have to explore the so-called reaction network um, in a process that I've also termed the structure generation and optimization. And so this means you have to determine all the involved intermediates and transition states. And the way you can imagine this is that you have to determine like the 2D roadmap that tells you which points are connected, but it also tells you like what is the pathway from your starting material to your end product. But if you've ever been hiking before, you know that just knowing that two points are connected doesn't really help you to know how long it will take to get there, which is why you need to know um, the terrain. So is it going uphill or downhill? So for this, you need to determine the energy profile and this would be done on a quantum computer through quantum phase estimation. And the way these two parts interact is that after having obtained such a reaction network on the left side, on the classical part, you have to transform all the involved intermediates and transition states into a representation on a quantum computer, which we do by selecting a, a certain active space and then obtaining the parameters to the Hamiltonian which are just uh, one and two electron intervals. And we would then simulate this Hamiltonian on a quantum computer and use quantum phase estimation. And the information flow in the other direction is that after you have this energy profile with the involved energy barriers, you can do a kinetic modeling. For this, of course, you have to um, correct the electronic energy first. And by having this kinetic modeling, you will know, for example, how efficient your catalyst is in transforming your starting material in your product, but you also might know where the bottleneck is in the overall reaction and how you have to tweak your catalyst structure to get a better turnover number. And of course, then you would have to repeat the whole process. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so as an example, to give you a bit of an illustration of how these reaction networks look like, I'm giving you uh, one here for the example of the Formosa reaction. So here we would still be on the left part of the previous side. And as you can see, these reaction networks are quite complex. So here each node uh, represents an intermediate and each edge 
is a reaction connection connecting certain intermediates. So you can see that there are um, numerous structures involved that have to be determined. Mm, but not only are there numerous, but they are also of a very diverse electronic structure. So you might have to explore several different spin states, charge states or protonation states and so forth. Plus, you might also encounter very complex electronic structures because you might have a catalyst in your system or because your transition states are of multi-reference character. And so this, um, there are many approaches to automate this step of the of reaction exploration, which also partly by our group. Um, but what, what's important is that we keep in mind that the boundary, the boundary conditions that this poses on a quantum algorithm. And the output from this step is such a reaction network. Uh, so next slide, please. And so if we move now to the right part of the, of the other slide, so on the determination of the energy profile, how we do this is that for each reaction, so each edge that we had in the previous network, we have to determine the energy barriers. And we do this by computing the energies of the involved intermediates, here shown on the left and the right side, and the energy of the so-called transition state in the middle. And the relative energies then give us the energy barriers that our molecules have to cross. And so you've heard this before because these energy barriers enter and um, enter the rates in an exponential form. We have to get them to a high accuracy, which is typically denoted by one or even um, 0 0.1 millihartree. But another important aspect of um, quantum computing um, when it relates to quantum chemistry methods is that in quantum chemistry, the algorithms we use or the methods we use have an unknown uncertainty attached to that. And that uncertainty might be, for example, due to the parametrization of your density functional, or it might be due to the unknown optimality of your bond dimension in a DMAG calculation. So especially in the case of DFT, your, your errors are unknown and they might also possibly large. So it's important to keep in mind that quantum computers through quantum phase estimation can already offer us a competitive advantage if they're, if they're able to um, give us reliable error estimates. So next slide, please. <coughs> and the output of this step, so which would still be on the very right part, would be such an energy profile, which I'm showing you here, which I've taken from the, from the paper shown at the bottom. And so, <coughs> So this was uh, energy profile that was uh, obtained just with DFT and manually. So obviously it's restricted in its size, <clears throat> but already here you can see that you, it's really important to consider a multitude of structures and you have to consider um, also branching uh, reaction pathways for you to really understand your efficiency of the catalyst. So I hope I could give you a bit of better understanding of the context in which we want to use our quantum computers. And we could summarize all of this into the fact that if we want to use our quantum computer and if we wanted to really enhance um, reaction mechanism exploration, we must be able to really treat efficiently a multitude of structures. Uh, we have to, it has to be robust in terms of the electronic structure. And the energies have to be obtained with high accuracy, and it will be really good if they can yield us um, uh, reliable error estimates. And yeah, I think we can skip the next slide as it was already mentioned before, which is just about how we convert them, the input, the, the, chemical, the chemicals to an input we can use in a quantum computer. Yes. And with that, I would like to hand over and if you have questions, Marcus and I will be available also in the chat. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Wang Hao and I'm a researcher at Microsoft. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of steps that are involved in going from this idea of getting energies on a quantum computer to actually 
implementing the circuit and also getting accurate resource estimates. As Matthias said, there's going to be a very large constant factor difference in the runtime between classical and quantum computers. For you know, a large problem, you might expect the crossover to be on the order of weeks, months, maybe even a year. So this means that if we, if we mess up our resource estimates by a factor of two, by a factor of 10, this has a very large real impact in exactly when we can expect quantum computers to be useful. So we need to be very careful when we look at all of these. And we also need to be careful in our choice of the algorithms we use to solve this problem. Quantum computers are not going to be general purpose machines. They're only going to solve special problems. So this means that when we look at the quantum algorithms we apply, we should choose quantum algorithms that have a unique advantage over analogous classical methods. And then here, one of the one such example is the competition between quantum phase estimation and VQE. We've seen these two approaches for estimating energies mentioned a lot in the literature. And in the near term, at least, VQE seems to be the most popular. But is it really the way of the future? So at the end of the day, what we want are accurate and precise energy estimates of your reaction mechanisms. And here, precision is easy. This is achievable in VQE just by measuring many, many times and repeating. In phase estimation, precision is also not a problem. problem. But accuracy is where the largest difference shows up between these two. In classical approaches, you have variational approach, you have variational techniques, and these have uh, an uncontrollable error. You can only upper bound the ground state energy, but you can never know how close you are to the truth. Uh, quantum phase estimation has this unique feature where you can actually bound how close you are to the truth with high probability. And this statement with high probability is where a lot of asterisks in the cost of these algorithms come in. It um, contains a lot of the uncomfortable truths that we need to address and really determining whether quantum computer will give us an advantage. Because in quantum phase estimation, sure, you can bound the error. You know, it's, it scales as 1 over epsilon. It scales as maybe quadratic cube, the number of terms. But then you have to repeat this many times, corresponding to what is the overlap of your trial state that you prepare on a quantum computer to the ground with the eigenstate that you care to investigate. This is a quantity that's usually um, a bit hard to know before the fact. And in VQE, you have something analogous. You have to do gradient descent on a quantum computer. You have to estimate the energies. You have to find all of these derivatives and vary these parameters. How many steps do we need to get down to minimizing the energy? A lot of um, estimates in the literature, they focus mainly on the cost of a single step. You know, If I want to measure one energy estimate, how expensive is it? If I want to measure one eigen energy with phase estimation, how expensive is it? Um, really, do people actually try to really dig into this big, um, you know, uncertainty about this uncomfortable truth? What is the trial state overlap and how many gradient descent steps there are? And VQE is great because you can realize demonstrations of large-ish systems on these devices. But then for QPE, you can only demonstrate very small systems. This is because it generally requires very large depth, and it also requires a lot more qubits. But in the long run, we expect that this unique advantage of phase estimation, you know, the controllable error, and also the better scaling means that it will win out maybe in the next 10 years. So let's go on to the next step, next slide. So this uncomfortable truth that we have to address for our QPE and which we did in our paper is exactly how hard is it to prepare a good approximation to the ground state? So this here is also a good illustration of why QPE tends to, we believe, do better than VQE. The reason is that, sure, in the worst case, making the ground state is a very, very hard problem. It is QMA hard. You can think of this as a quantum generalization of NP. But just as how many um, NP problems actually have good approximate solutions, sometimes when you prepare approximate ground states, you can also get lucky. Lucky here meaning that the, your trial state can have a reasonably large overlap with the ground truth. And in QPE, in order to get an accurate energy estimate, all you need is that your trial state has a constant overlap with the ground truth. You know, it could be 10%, it could be 1%, so long as it's not something that is negligible. But for VQE, if you wanted to get an accurate energy estimate, the constraints on how close you have to be to the ground state, how close your answers must be, are a lot more stringent. If you wanted like a one milli Hartree error, 
then you need a VQE trial state that is close to the ground truth by less than one in a million. Um, this comes from, you know, uh, one milli tree. That's one in 1,000 times a certain energy scale of your Hamiltonian, which is also on the order of 1,000 tree. So in our paper, we found out that at least for some typical cases in this uh, carbon capture catalytic cycle, the ground states that we care to study actually are we have reasonably large overlaps with even just a single determinant state. So this is not going to be true in general, but it kind of points to how this issue of gas evaporation has a chance of actually being addressable in practice. Whereas for VQE, it is still always going to be an extremely hard problem. Next slide, please. So now that we've chosen our algorithm, we now need to think about how to circuitize it. And Exactly how you circuitize it depends on which era of quantum computing you're looking at because the resources that matter differ a lot. In the NISC era, we are really working at the physical level, our qubits, the yeah, individual circuit elements that you print out on your wafer. The noise is high and because these elements are on the wafer, you favor interactions between them, quantum gates that are nearest neighbor. And also the quantum gates that you can apply easily, they tend to be things that are you know driven by a pulse. You can always continuously read the parameters of a pulse. So you can apply primitive quantum gates like single qubit or two qubit rotations that have a continuous choice of rotation angles. And usually we think about the cheap gates there as being single qubit gates, whereas the expensive gates are those that act on multiple qubits. And a lot of um, studies that try to express the cost of quantum algorithms, usually at the start implicitly, maybe they not really mention explicitly, they make a choice of which um, type of machine that I use. And usually people assume that it's a cheap gate, it's a, um, the gates in the NISC era that matter, and they decompose the algorithms as such. But in the logical um, level, on machines that we expect to have maybe in the next 10 years, the situation is quite different. Um, to, uh, to some extent, we no longer really need to constrain ourselves to just assuming nearest neighbor connectivity. Um, some types of long-range interactions between our qubits is possible. For instance, for instance, uh, protocols like teleportation to move your qubits and information around. And the gates that we assume that we can do easily are also different. Rather than having a continuous set of quantum gates, you only now have a discrete set of gates. And the cheap gates are, in contrast to the NISC era, they are long-range gates. They are Clifford gates that can act on many qubits, and usually we consider them to be like something that is a factor of 100 to 1,000 times or even 10,000 times cheaper than the non-Clifford gates. These are the expensive gates and the gates that are needed to make quantum computation universal. Some examples of these are the T-gate and the Toffley gate. So next slide, please. So within this um, framework of circuitization, there's been a lot of recent work that tries to um, figure out asymptotically what is the cost of simulating or solving these chemistry problems on a quantum computer. And over the years, you can see that there's been a lot of progress from 2013 to 20, um, recently 2020. And you can see that as time passes, the dependence on number of orbitals, it goes down. That's great. Dependence on time goes down. That's also great. And if you're to look at the gate cost, there's also this difference between um, the easy gates and the hard gates. Early, early estimates didn't really distinguish between these two, but later estimates kind of try to isolate the resources that really matter and minimize them. So if you're to just look at all of these scaling factors, it seems pretty great. We're on a great trajectory towards you know, realizing practical applications. But the truth is that asymptotic performance really doesn't isn't very useful. It doesn't give us a concrete understanding of saying, is quantum computing going to be useful like next year, 10 years, 100 years? This is because, next slide, please. The constant factors um, really matter. So in the early days of quantum computing, people were happy if you had an algorithm that was so-called efficient. So efficient just meant that it scaled polynomially with a number of, say, orbitals. You know, classically, you might say that if you wanted to diagonalize a um, matrix for n fermions, this would take exponential time. So if a quantum computer could do it in n to the five time, you know, that's great. You know, that's like supposed to be undeniable evidence of the utility of quantum computers. But that is actually not true at all. We are now at a stage where just simply saying that you get 
an efficient algorithm is not enough, we really need to work out these constant factors because these constant factors can mean the difference in runtimes from you know, 100,000 years to just one week. And in the past four years, we've worked very hard at using the best simulation algorithms, the best quantum techniques to bring this cost down from something that was provably unrealistic um, four years ago to something that is quite almost, you could even say, feasible to just um, today. And when we examine the scaling of how all of these algorithms, um, how these algorithms cost for real examples, like in the carbon capture case, we find out, find out that across a large range of orbitals, the gate counts are going to lead to run times that are on the order of at most like a month for down to weeks. So next slide, please. So with all of this advance, or with all of these advances, you know what's next? What else can we do to further solidify our, you know, our faith in the promise of quantum computing. So since 1995, that was when the first explicit algorithm for simulating all of these chemistry problems was developed. There have been a lot of um, new algorithms, and these new algorithms, they capitalize on different structural properties of the problem that you care to simulate. And for each of these algorithms, they have um, different trade-offs. You know, they might use more of certain types of gates, like maybe they might use more non more clifford gates, but they might use fewer non clifford gates and so on. And so far, very few studies have been done that really exhaustively try to squeeze out as much performance as we can from these algorithms. There have been early um, studies about trotterization applied to chemistry, and by now, these are already somewhat out of date because as um, research progresses, you develop new techniques, new optimizations. And our best understanding of the potential of trotterization is, you know, now something that we should look at again, at, look again once more. A lot of focus now is on cubitization, and I think the results have been very promising. But then there have been also other algorithms that I think are potentially of high impact, but there hasn't really been a systematic study on their performance. And looking at those could be one way to figure out in the future whether there could be further improvements to be had. Then this is, that's for revolutionary improvements on the algorithm side. But there are also a lot of other more incremental improvements to important that can reduce the cost. For instance, when we apply all of these um, algorithms, one of the key subroutines is this QRAM. Is QRAM. And in the past few years, the, we, since QRAM was discovered, the constant factors implementing QRAM has gone down by factors of 2 to 4 to 8. So I'm not sure how much more we can squeeze out of that, but then it kind of tells us that every factor of two is important and every factor of two halves a threshold for when it would be useful. Next slide, please. So that was it for, algor for opportunities and algorithms, but this is not something that's only limited to people who work in you know, quantum algorithms. There's a lot of um, interesting potential out there for those also working in quantum chemistry. For instance, in choosing the best representation to represent your molecule in. Different representations, they have different features, and different quantum algorithms, they capitalize on different types of these features. So in, initially, people would use the unfactorized representation, but a series of work recently looked into different low rank representations of this as a single factorized, as the double factorized, and um, as of a few months ago, there's a hyper contracted representation um, applied to quantum algorithms. And all of these are important because um, they reduce the number of terms needed to represent Hamiltonian, which is very, which has a direct impact on the cost of the algorithm, and they also reduce the number of steps needed. There are also other aspects you could look at. For instance, if you were to fix the number of orbitals, could we still get an even more accurate representation? You know, by to minimize the basis set error by choosing different basis sets or downfolding high lying states into low lying states. Um, so now, Matthias will wrap up. Uh, Matthias, you are still muted. So I think I could unmute myself. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Yes, okay. yes. Right. Okay, good. So to wrap up, we looked then at the, 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 the run times and the number of yeah, qubits one needs. And first, we looked at a case where we said, let us use the smallest uh, less number of qubits. Uh, that's uh, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, a couple of hundred qubits. And uh, 
and as assuming fidelities for the decades of 99.9%, that means we need about half a million Jefferson qubits. But then the runtime with the sensible assumptions on the clock speeds of the gates would be about 30 months. Now, we don't want to wait 30 months, but fortunately we can do trade-offs. We can say, let us use more qubits and bring down the number of the non clifford gates. And doing that, if you, you, you use uh, so, so, 10 times more qubits, then the runtime comes down by about the factor of 40. So that's why we say we need a few thousand qubits, logical ones, which with near three lines here, 50, 50, 50 fidelity translates to, to, to roughly uh, 50 to 4 million physical qubits. And then the runtime comes down to weeks. We can bring the runtime down further by going more parallel. But there are some trade of then kind of to how many qubits do you want to add versus just waiting three weeks. But what we see is basically it is doable, but the scale is in the millions of qubits. And so to, 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 to summarize kind of when and where do we think will we really have practical quantum impact to go quantum curve that the computer solving the impactful problems. As I mentioned here at the, the start, they have to be small data problems, big compute problems, uh, uh, with a super per, per quadratic speed up. Chemistry problems seem the most likely candidate here. But what is important also, so, so what we like, pointed out is that you really have to go through example and really find out what are the typical like, the electronic states we want to look at, and then not just look at the dotic scaling, but at the numbers. The good news is it's feasible. The challenge is we'll need a fault tolerant quantum computer with millions of qubits. So that's what we have to aim for. And then we can have a disruptive impact on chemistry. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, that was a wonderful, was a wonderful uh, very uh, interesting very talk interesting with talk. a lot of different aspects brought in. Thank you, Wong Hao and, um, and Vera for also contributing. Um, and I guess we can open up the questions. I believe there's also questions inside of the, um, inside of the Slack as well, um, if, if people want to ask questions there. Mm, I mean, I can probably ask the question from the Slack that, that they made. Um, Question is this, uh, so um, uh, you really advocate uh, the quantum phase estimation for quantum simulation here, and uh, you made some compelling arguments that in the near term, we'll have this kind of finite overlap trial states. But in the long run, how can we ensure that this overlap stays finite? How can we ensure production of such trial states? Right, so first we can compare VQE and QPE. However difficult it is to prepare the trial state for QPE, VQE will only have it orders of magnitude worse. So there is always going to be a good reason to favor QPE over VQE. Now the next question, the next aspect of this is, is QPE even practical if we screw up to large problems? Because as you're uh, asking, how do we ensure that this uh, trial state preparation has just a constant overlap with the ground truth? The reality is that we cannot guarantee this. Um, you can always construct worst case examples when making even a constant overlap is exponentially hard. But here we are really relying on the hope that chemistry on average is kind of like an average case problem, not a worst case problem. You can certainly construct molecules that maybe artificial molecules that exhibit this worst case behavior. But hopefully the average case behavior that we found in our paper would be more of the truth. And as to really figure out whether this is really preparable in the future, can you know this before the fact? One thing you could try to do is to do extrapolation. You can look at the overlap for small basis sets, 
for instance, in the continuum limit, you could use a few basis sets. And this is something you could conceivably um, get pretty good guesses of the true ground state, maybe either by FCI methods. Then you could extrapolate this to the continuum limit, more basis sets, and hopefully see whether this overlap goes up or goes down and stays within acceptable bounds. Thanks. There's a number of other questions inside the um, Slack, but I think they're being answered. Um, there's one here that hasn't been asked, and this is the Toffoli gates eigenvectors alpha norm versus n orbital plots. How are you increasing n? For example, when you increase the number of atoms, basis functions, or the size of active space, or is there some difference between these three? So in these examples, this is um, fixing the size of your system and going to the continuum limit, so increasing the active space site size. Um, Vera could elaborate more. Sorry, can you just Sorry, repeat that part? I was concerned with the uh, questions in the Slack. Yes, yeah, so this is a question in Slack. This is uh, the, the second question. It says, um, in the Toffoli eigenvectors norms versus in orbitals plots, how are you increasing in? Um, so, example, you increase the number of atoms, basis sets, or the size of the active space, and is there a difference between these three? Uh, yeah, so what we did is where we we increased the size of the active space. So, we looked at um, a number of different intermediates and transition states, and for each of them, we obtained three different sizes of active spaces, which are supposed to be of, like, increasing complexity. And then on the plots, you see the plots are just the values for all of the different resource estimates we obtained overall, all of the different um, structures. Okay, and I have one last question. So in the analysis uh, comparing VQE and quantum phase estimation, um, why is it not possible to run um, one after the other, somehow combine them that you can get this uh, collapse of the wave function after using a VQE, a relatively high accuracy? Right. That's possible, definitely. The, and uh, that is here something that you might do if you can't get uh, uh, the that trial state that is here to, 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 to good enough. But then you don't have to get uh, the to, to good trial state. It has to, 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 have an, to, to overlap that is to, 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 to good enough to be of order one. It doesn't have to be, be negative, accurate. And so so likely you can do that also so with a, a, a classical method that would be cheaper. A, a classical DMC method or, or, or some other ansatz, that's good enough. If you should find a case where you can't find that, then VK could be a, a, a good first step. And then you start out from there with QP. 